This little African girl says she was held captive by an Arab man, then offered to another as a sex slave in exchange for five cows. Slave kidnapper smashed his eyes, says this man, then stole his wife and children. And this woman explained she lost three of her children, they died of thirst. She was beaten and raped by her abductor. These stories, so shocking and hard to believe, are happening now in North Africa and the neighboring Persian Gulf, according to American and African abolitionists. They take a trip to the Sudan to see for themselves and verify reports that tens of thousands of women and children have been stolen, used and abused, even killed by government-backed Arab militiamen. The abolitionists masquerade as buyers, the man in white is said to be a slave trader. 458 slaves, he'll get about 3 million Sudanese pounds, about $100, or two cows per child. The abolitionist leadership council accuses the United States of ignoring such abuses. The call for action also goes out to African American leaders. This girl's leg was tied so tightly to her master's horse that the cord left this brutal scar. Sudanese officials, even some Americans, deny that this human bondage takes place. But the trader claims the government protects the enslavers. For now, though, there is good news for these women and children. When I first met you this morning, I told you that there are many people around the world who pray for you, who help solve your problems, and you are all now free to go to your families. But as the slave trade continues, who knows what lies ahead? For BET Talk, I'm Doxy McCoy, Here's Tavis Smiley. Good evening and welcome to BET Talk. It is quite difficult to believe that slavery still exists in the 1990s. And there are, of course, those who in fact try to deny it. But my guests tonight have had experiences uh, that prove otherwise. We are joined tonight by three individuals. First up, Jane Alley, who escaped a slave raid in the Sudan. We're also joined tonight by John Eibner, who purchased slaves from Sudanese traders. And finally, we're joined tonight by Samuel Cotton, who is a journalist and the executive director of the Coalition Against Slavery in Mauritania and the Sudan. I should also mention that Mr. Eibner, sitting across from me, is also with the Christian Solidarity International Organization. Let me say welcome to all three of you. Thank you. Good Thanks be for here. being here. Let me, let me, I, I, my notes tell me to start with Jane. After seeing that piece, I want to do otherwise, if I can, Mr. Cotton or Samuel, if I can call you, and start with you, because I want to ask you specifically why it is that we don't hear more about stories like this. This seems like a pretty horrendous situation people in the 1990s still being bought and sold into slavery. Why, number one, in the United States don't we hear more about this? And number two, um, who do you blame uh, for Americans not hearing, uh, particularly African Americans, not hearing more about this? You don't hear uh, more about this because <clears throat> the media hasn't deemed until quite recently that this is an important issue. The uh, buying and selling and breeding of black Africans hasn't been held uh, as something important by the media. Two, I blame uh, African-American leaders, particularly those in Congress, who have known for quite a bit of time that this has been taking place because of the congressional hearings that have been held on the Hill quite a bit. So I blame them for not educating, uh, not advocating, not letting the African-American people know that the same slave trade, particularly uh, in, in Mauritania and in Sudan, uh, which brought us here to this country, continued, in fact, never stopped. And so I blame them for that. To say that you blame the Congressional Black Caucus is a serious charge, and I, I don't take exception with you. I just want to ask you um, why it is that you think our African-American national legislators are so unwilling, as it, as it were, to not bring this story to us. What is it that doesn't, about this story, that apparently has not gotten their attention and gotten their interest in terms of bringing that message, as they did with apartheid in South Africa, to the breadth and depth of the black community in this country. Okay, shockingly enough, I'll use Congressman Payne, Donald Payne of New Jersey's words. Former chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus. Correct. Right. Uh, this uh, this uh, is the only individual who is on the point concerning this issue, and he said to Channel 9 about four months ago that his colleagues have not come to the point that they feel that the slavery issue in Mauritania and Sudan warrants their attention at this time. And that is why you, you will see, and if you'll check the record, uh, Donald Payne has been on this issue virtually alone. And so that, that's the answer. I think Donald is putting it exactly in that way. Okay, let me, let me shift gears now and talk to Jane here. Jane, you are a native of the Sudan. 
uh, and you have a, a pretty interesting story, for lack of a better word, about how you escaped a slave raid one night. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, yes, I can tell you all this about uh, what took place. It actually happened on uh, September 15, 1990, and uh, I was preparing lunch, and uh, all of a sudden I heard the sound of airplanes, like airplanes in the distance. And what I did was I continued my preparation of lunch, and uh, uh, then I went inside and I got my children. By then, one of my children, uh, two of my girls, Ayoba, age 10, Kojo, age 6, were playing with my neighbor's children, Jonathan, age uh, 11, and uh, Gire, age 10, and Yeno, age six, age 6. They were playing together in my neighbor Tokosang's compound, and uh, when I heard this, this sound, I went ahead and continued preparing my lunch. So at around 1.30 p.m., I had, we had just finished lunch, just like I had called the kids, we, we, we finished doing this lunch, we finished eating, then uh, all hell, hell broke loose. And uh, I just saw so three Arab soldiers emerge from, the, from nowhere. They came, one of them went around setting fires on the hearts, Two of them went to my neighbor Tokosang's compound, and uh, then I start. I, I heard Tokosang start crying. She was like, um, "What do you want? Leave my children alone! Don't hurt my children!" So when I heard her cry like that, I continued, you know, listening, and I, I was frantic, I was scared. What what was really happening? Then she continued crying. The kids came in, and the kids were also crying. I heard the sound of the children calling, "Mama, Mama, Mama." And I, I started walking towards her, 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 her compound to see what was taking place. Then I heard this sound, a gunshot. And, you know, she stopped crying, and I knew she was, you know, shot. And then I turned back to my house, got my children, and we ran to a nearby bush and hid behind the bush. And uh, I actually lay on top of my children because there was a lot of total confusion. Machine guns were, you know, running all over. So, so, so you, you obviously escaped that night, and thankfully, but do you know people that night who were, in fact, captured and caught up in this slave trading? Definitely. Tokosang's children were, were caught in that slave trade, and they were taken. I've never heard about them. I don't know what has happened so These to persons them. have never been found. You've never heard from them at all? Never. Uh, let me ask you, John. You, in fact, bought slaves to specifically secure their freedom, and I want to be clear about saying that. I don't want folks to see a white man on the set and assume that you're one of the ones involved, one of the bad guys. But you, in fact, bought slaves to secure their freedom. Tell me about how you got involved and why specifically you involved yourself in this particular way. Well, we got involved uh, in our early trips to Sudan. I've been to Sudan many times in recent years uh, on covert missions. We have to go into Sudan without the permission of the government of, uh, of Sudan. They don't allow us to go in, but we do go in anyway. And we had heard reports and rumors of, of slavery that have had a little bit of evidence. But a year and a half ago, we went to a, um, an area in northern Bar al Ghazal, which is the borderlands between northern and southern Sudan, an area that is uh, constantly affected by slave raids. And we just could not believe um, how many victims there were in terms of uh, people who had been killed in the raids, but also uh, you know, hundreds of, um, of uh, women and children were taken into slavery. We made that first discovery and felt that we must uh, go back and uh, provide whatever assistance we can. I've got to take a break here, and when we come back on the other side of this break, I, of course, want to take some phone calls and talk more about this subject. I particularly, now that we've talked about the fault that can be laid at the feet of black elected officials, I want to talk about the role that the Clinton administration has or has not played in this ongoing slave trade in North Africa. We're going to continue this conversation in just a moment on the other side of this break with your phone calls, so stand by. We're back in just a little bit. Welcome back to BET Talk. In case you just joined us tonight, we are talking about the fact that in 1996, believe it or not, slaves are still being bought and sold uh, in the world in which we live. We're joined tonight by three people who had experiences who know exactly of what we speak uh, tonight. And we're going to go to the phone calls in just a second. Before I do, though, let me go back to you, uh, if I can, Samuel, and ask you the question that I posed before the break. Uh, you were very, uh, not gun-shy at all about blaming uh, African-American leaders in the first segment. Right. Let me ask you, though, what role the Clinton administration has or has not played. I noted today when I was researching this issue, uh, as I recall, that uh, former Secretary of State, well, he's still Secretary of State now, Warren Christopher, has taken 24 trips to the Middle East during his tenure, 18 trips alone to the country of Syria. It wasn't until October of this year that he took his first trip to the continent of Africa. 
I'm wondering how much blame you lay at the feet of the Clinton administration alongside the Congressional Black Caucus. Quite a bit. Uh, in Mauritania, point one. Mauritania had its approximately, as calculated from 1981, the London Anti-Slavery Group, about 90,000 black chattel slaves. The generations which had come from the slave raids that began back as early as 1644. So we have known in Mauritania that there were that many black chattel slaves owned by Arab Berbers. The State Department in the last two years reflected that. But uh, when the, the uh, Mauritanian government began to break its relationships with Saddam Hussein, the State Department began to whitewash and just say that the slaves' uh, situation was over and only the vestiges remained. I went undercover in Mauritania for 28 days conducting ethnographic research and brought back to Congress on March, in March of this year, photographs, video, audio, reflecting the fact that slave trading is still endemic in that country. This, so therefore, the State Department was shown to be basically whitewashing and uh, sashaying on this issue with that country. I must take some phone calls very quickly, though. So what, do you, so what do you say to Madeleine Albright, the apparent new Secretary of State for the Clinton administration? There's slavery in Sudan also, and 2.5 million Africans are dead, almost half the number that died in the Jewish Holocaust, and the Clinton administration has not reacted to this type of death, murder, and slavery on the east and west coast of Africa. Let's take some phone calls. We'll start tonight in Boston. Shamika, thanks for holding. You're on BET Talk. Um, I was just um, wanted to comment on what Mr. Karin was just saying because uh -huh. my question was basically um, how did they feel about the government not reacting to what's going on over there in that country as to how they reacted with Saddam Hussein trying to take over the Kuwaiti people and how they rushed our troops over there to help them. Do they think that it's racial racial involvement in, involved with our government also on how they respond on different um, different people trying to do, take over the countries and slavery and everything. Shamika, you throw a lot out there. Let me grab a piece of it and throw it at John Ivner. John, how much of this has to do with race versus religion? I was reading this today. It almost reminded me, um, this may be a bad comparison of the Bosnian situation in that there's so much there's so much in there. How much of it is race? How much of it is religion? Well, you cannot really quantify it. The two are, are mixed up in a way that you cannot disentangle them. Race and religion, especially for, the, say, the Arabs of Sudan, are almost one and the same. There's a process of Islamization of the country going on at the same time as there is a process of Arabization. The two go very much hand in hand. Let's go, let's go to Montana then and talk to Paul. Paul, thanks for holding. You're on BET Talk. Yes, good evening, Tavis. Good evening. Uh, first, I'd like to say that I don't think there's anything peculiar about Bill Clinton or Madeleine Albright or Warren Christopher not caring about this. Uh, the history of the USA is to use Africa uh, as slavery and for work and, and, and treat it like dirt. Uh, so that's not surprising. But what I would like to address is the whole uh, issue of Louis Farrakhan, mm -hmm. uh, who has been uh, really shameful ab ab about this issue. Uh, in the same way, we forget that he, uh, he uh, said he murdered Malcolm X, and everybody seems to forget that. And I think this is indicative of the fact that if Louis Farrakhan ever got in power, he would oppress in the same way that, uh, that, that black people in this country are oppressed now. He would oppress from a Muslim perspective. And I would like people to comment on that. And why is Lu How much money does Louis Farrakhan get uh, from the Sudanese government uh, to keep his mouth shut about this and to lie. Paul in Montana, thank you for your phone call. I'm going to leave the Malcolm X statement alone for the time being. I will, however, pick up on the comment that Minister Farrakhan made some time ago that he did not believe that there was, in fact, slavery in the Sudan. How, how would you respond to Minister Farrakhan or anybody else who says that this stuff just does not happen? Jane? Well, I, to me, I think it's just he's just deceiving himself, one thing. He just has to come out and uh, think about where he's coming from, first of all before he takes the face value of the dollars that he may be getting, you know, from the, the Sudanese government, let him think about his own people as a people, first of all, you know. I know he's denying, but I don't know if that's really coming out of him from his own personal conscience. Mr. Farrakhan clearly is a controversial and interesting phenomenon. I need a quick response before this break, if I can mm -hmm. get one. He's, a, he's clearly an interesting and controversial figure. I'm wondering whether or not you think his statement, his bold statement, that this was not, in fact, happening, uh, the slave trade, that is, hurt or helped your um, your campaign? I mean, did it really have any impact at all is what I'm trying to It helped to the add. campaign. Yes. Yeah. It helped the campaign. In what way? Well, first of all, he's a controversial figure and there are a number of individuals who would like to get him. So, when he made such a statement that flies in the face of all the data and research that exists, it created a, a media frenzy. So, therefore, uh, most of the media, I think, at this point, 
and prior were not that interested in the issue of the fact that blacks are still being bought and sold, but that there was a black leader that they have controversy with, they're catching in a, in, in a terrible position for his people. And so this caused the media to come in, and now we have light on the subject that on both horns of Africa, slavery exists. I'm obliged to take another break right here. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation about, as you just heard Samuel Cotton say, blacks being bought and sold into slavery, even in 1996. Back on the other side of this break, stay right there. Welcome back to BET Talk. Let me uh, just say for the record that we, in fact, knew or presumed that this Farrakhan issue was going to come up tonight. We, in fact, contacted Minister Farrakhan's Chicago office today. We did not receive a response, so I want to say that in fairness to those in the Nation of Islam. Let's go back to the phone line now to Tina in Ohio. Tina, thanks for holding you on BET Talk. Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, my first question is, um, how long will we as displaced Africans allow the world to feed upon our family? Uh, these could be our brothers and sisters. Uh, we need to wake up and realize that they are not just feeding on us, but our past and our future. And my second um, question is, uh, the, the United States and the UN, um, the, 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 I'm sorry, <laughs> the civil war in, Bo in Bosnia has just now come to a head with the fall down of, of the breakdown of communism. Uh, what's the matter? This has been going on for centuries. Why has it not stopped? Why have we not seen anything done? Now. Let me let me pick up on the last part of your question, Tina. I thank you for your phone call. Samuel, tell me whether or not the fact that we as black uh, in the diaspora, those of us here in this country, have not gotten involved beyond the fact that our black leaders haven't talked about it, because this really has so much more to do with war and tribalism in these countries, so many issues that are so convoluted that we just can't see to talk about the slave trade because of all the wars and the tribal warfare that's going on in these countries. Well, war and tribal, I uh, see, it, it requires an investment of intellectual capital. The uh, situation in Mauritania is clear cut. White Berbers, Arab Berbers, enslave white Arab Berbers who are Muslim, enslave black Muslims. Very clear situation. No confusion, no tribal warfare, no battle going on. In Sudan, the North is raiding the South. They are forcing Islam on people who don't want it. They are also enslaving Muslims who want to be Africans and yet Muslim, without losing their tongues, without losing their traditions. So we might think that the issue is so complex that we can't see it. But analysis of both Mauritania and Sudan boiled it down to something that can be readily understood and not something that can't be. The reason why it's not approached is because there's a high threshold on the suffering in Africa for people. So what they have to understand is, this is the next level. Past the murder and death that goes on in both of those countries is the issue of buying and selling and breeding Africans, and we must look at that in an ad hoc way. Okay, John Eidner, let's assume for the moment that it is clear-cut. I understand it. Black America watching understands it. Tell me then why it is in the best interest of black America to get involved uh, with raising hell, as it were, about this particular issue. Well, really, because f freedom is indivisible. Uh, African Americans, white Americans, cannot be truly free while there are others uh, around the world suffering such terrible human uh, rights violations, you know, such as slavery in, in Sudan. We have to help those who are on the, the front line of the, their own struggle for freedom, be it in Sudan, in Mauritania, and in other places in the world. And we cannot cop out by saying it's too complicated, we can't really get in, involved, we can't understand the, uh, uh, the situation. Surely the same could have been said about slavery in the United States. It's a complex uh, phenomenon, but that cannot be an excuse for uh, failing to get involved. I have to take one more break here. When we come back, though, I want to give Jane the opportunity before we end this show tonight to talk about the violation of women, particularly in children, uh, in the country where she's from, that being the country of Sudan. Stay with us. One more break. We're back in just a second. Welcome back to BET Talk, our remaining moments as we talk about the slave trade in North Africa. Tomorrow night, uh, we can laugh a little bit, nothing funny to tonight, but tomorrow night, comedian Bernie Mac is with us here at 11 p.m. Eastern, so be here tomorrow night for Bernie Mac. Though Jane, in the remaining moments I have here, tell me about uh, how women and children specifically are singled out for these slave trades. They're singled out. What's happening is they're embarking on mutilation of genital parts of the women. You know, that's very, very, very important, and that's a major crime for us because as Africans, we don't circumcise our women. Once our women are taken into slavery, that's what happens. They circumcise them, and that's against our culture. 
Samuel, is it realistic to think with all the problems that African Americans have in this country, that wherever, no matter how much uh, smoke is raised by this issue, is it realistic to assume that we're ever going to get involved in this particular issue the way you would like to see us get involved, and that's from the black leadership on down? We better. Ibn Khaldun said that the Negro is the only one who accepts slavery. This question is now out to the jury. Will the Muslim community address the fact that their fellow black Muslims are being enslaved in Mauritania? Will the Christian black church recognize that black Christians are being murdered for their faith and taken into slavery? Will the Muslims accept the fact that Muslims in the Nuba Mountains are being murdered because they want to be Muslim but uh, want to remain African? Is Ibn Khaldun right? The Negro is the only one who accepts the enslavement of his people in silence? This, this is the question, so we have to get involved in this. Thanks for coming by, Samuel Cotton. Nice to meet you. John Ivner, thanks for coming by. Jane Alley, pleasure to meet you. Thank you, Thank you for being here. Thank you, of course, for being here. We hope we uh, educated you a little bit about what's happening in 1996 as we live slave trade still, in fact, going on in Northern Africa. Thanks for being here tonight as we are here every Monday through Thursday with a new edition of BET Talk. We will be back again tomorrow night. Until tomorrow night at 11 Eastern, keep the faith.